Ah, that was golden. <laughs> oh, Robert, I'm so sorry so, that didn't happen. Maybe it wasn't golden. Everyone's like, uh, we didn't even hear what you said, guy. We'll reshoot. We'll reshoot that part. So we'll reshoot that. the agents, agents and clients alike are both making a correlation between the last recession, which if you think about a lot of the consumers in the marketplace right now, if we know that uh, more than 30% of, of transactions that happened last year were first time home buyers, the majority of people in the marketplace, either first time home buyers or second time home buyers, um, they, they only know the last recession and a good market. So a lot of them, even that lived through that last recession, a lot of those people weren't even in a consumer mindset going through that last recession. So they only know this long economic positive run that we've had, and they're making a direct correlation of recession equals this recession recession equals the last recession. Thus, it's going to have the same result on the marketplace. Now, my dad is a history buff. He is always reading history books. And to tell you the truth, as a kid, it drove me nuts because if I got stuck in his truck for a drive, he was giving me some history lesson. And I hated history until he made a connection for me, which was um, that it's not just what happened, it's what lessons we can learn from the historical event. And so I, today I'm going to show you how this recession differs from that of the recession of 2007 to 2010, because there are some very clear differences. And there are some lessons that we can learn from that. And, and there's some expectation around how things can't, will show up uh, as a, a, a consistency that will repeat themselves. But it's not going to be an exact mirror image in repeating it because the cause and effect uh, is different. So a big piece of this is breaking down, and Robert hit some of these points perfectly, is what, what were the causes that led up to this economic uh, downturn? And based on that cause, what is the effect? Because the, the, whatever the cause is will trigger a different effect. And so we're going to talk through that today. So um, I prepared some basic graphs uh, that I want to walk you through today. Um, if you have questions, uh, use your chat box at the bottom of the, your screen. You can click there and type in questions. Um, we'll kind of be monitoring. Um, if you have something you want to pipe in, uh, be sure to, to uh, quickly let me know you have a comment. Uh, but I want to stay really relevant on the points because we have a limited amount of time and I want to give you specific content to what we're meeting about today. Um, so let me share um, my screen as we walk through this uh, together here. Uh, Jackie, will you confirm you can see my screen? Robert, can you see my, my screen okay? Perfect. Okay, so uh, let's walk through this. And you guys have probably seen some of these uh, uh, graphs in, in doing your own research, but I've consolidated them down. Uh, be sure to drop your email address uh, in, in the comments. And uh, we, we probably have your email address from the sign-in too that I'll send these slides out for you to have as graphics in your conversation. So uh, a couple of real things, that, uh, a couple of important things to lay the foundation of our conversation, again, is the cause and effect. Uh, a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about were leading up to the recession that started in 2010, were things that as we look back, we could say, oh my gosh, based on uh, buyer demand and overpricing in the marketplace, we should have seen this coming where realistically what, what caused this, now the other things play into this because they're going to be affected by it, but was, what caused this was a health pandemic where there was an immediate like, it's coming, we know it's coming, and then we didn't understand the severity of it until our government started saying, hey, stop uh, going to restaurants, stop going to school. And that's when a lot of us embraced it as the, the severe pandemic that it was. And it was almost like a light switch in some ways that occurred and then everything else is being affected by that trigger or by that cause where a lot of the things that are being affected by that cause affordability uh unemployment um the uh, number of house sales that are going on are being affected by it but they were not the cause to it and that is a clear clear difference from what we saw in 2008 is each of those things played into the cause of the recession the great recession of 2008 so a quick comment, uh, basically we know that from, and I don't wanna make this a conversation around what's happening with the coronavirus, but specifically we know there are three uh, basic ways that the government's working on getting us past this. Number one 
is a vaccination. You guys are probably reading articles on that. They've got 20 plus uh, vaccination types in process right now. Hey, Marcus. Uh, I, I don't want to, sorry to interrupt, but everybody's throwing their emails in here. I can pull the uh, registration list at the end. So we won't, we won't need you guys to put it in the chat box. We'll make sure everybody gets it from the registration list. Perfect. Thank you. So vaccination, you guys know that there's a bunch of different vaccinations in process right now uh, that are being worked on. That is a big deal once, once they figure out the perfect vaccine, which, will, which is a preventative measure. It's not a treat, treatment, it's prevention. Um, and a couple of quick things that I thought were interesting to share with you if you don't already know is uh, they've got a lot of these all over the world. There's a worldwide effort, and it's kind of a race to see who comes up with the vaccine first. And then even when they, even when they develop the vaccine, which they're confident they will, it's really, as they, as they speed it up, and they're, they're going to fast track it as fast as they can, it's still 12 to 18 months before that hits the marketplace. But you see someone like uh, Bill Gates, he's already come out and said he's going to open specific factories once they find it that is gonna do nothing but uh, create the vaccines at a fast level. So there, the vaccination, it sounds like a long time, but it's being fast-tracked. Uh, there's a lot of different treatment opportunities that are being uh, brought into place right now. And then the other piece of this is, uh, you know, obviously herd immunity is happening every day at a slow pace, but it's happening already. And then lastly is some of the things that we are doing right now are gonna be permanent changes to our behavior meaning we'll probably see a lot more virtual uh, business opportunities. Um, we'll probably see uh, opportunities to close things virtually. We'll probably see different times of the year that are escalated high risk times where people are probably gonna, it's gonna be a norm to see people wearing masks and gloves into the grocery stores during flu, flu seasons and things like that that we're going to see. Um, the, the two biggest uh, direct correlations that people are making their conclusions on right now is uh, home prices and the recent stock market crash. So I wanna talk about those uh, real briefly. Let's talk about the stock market for a minute. Is we all know that uh, in the month of March, we saw a huge decline in the stock market. Um, and we've already seen a significant, not full recovery, but a lot of bounce back, uh, which the bounce back is driven by consumer confidence of uh, being able to have confidence that we're headed in the right direction. Now, there still is a lot of uncertainty and a stock price only trades at what a someone is willing to sell it for and what someone is willing to buy it for similar to a house the price of a house is driven basically on what is a, a willing seller willing to sell it for to a willing buyer that's willing to pay for it stock prices are the same and there's going to be some effects things that come into the marketplace like unemployment uh, lower wages things like that that will there'll be less disposable income for people to say, I'm willing to spend this on this stock. So we might still see some fluctuations in the stock market that way, but I wanted to show a couple of clear things. This graph here is a long-term trend of the Dow, which we know basically, if you wanna see the long-term, the basic trend of the market, the, the two major ones that are tracked are the Dow, the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the S&P 500. So look specifically here on uh, the Dow Jones since 2007, we saw what happened to the stock market in the Great Recession of 2008 to 2010. A monster decline came, but look what happened is it took, it took months and months and months for it to finally go from its peak to its trough. And then it slowly took years and years and years to build back to where it was beforehand. So we didn't get back to pre-Great Recession uh, Dow prices until almost 2013. You can see over time that the market continued to increase to record highs. And then we saw in March a steep decline. Now it's really hard to see what happened here because this huge decline in March, if you look down to the one month average of the Dow Jones, uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average, it went from the high in the, in the high 20s, like 26,000 in, in that one month range. The high over the last year is 29,000. It did have a significant decrease, but look what ha what's happened to the stock market uh, in the last 15 days. It's slowly building back confidence to where We've already recovered a portion of that. Now, that doesn't mean that it's gonna to continue to go up. There's probably some uncertainty that's gonna bounce based on what news comes into the marketplace. And you can see a similar reaction here with the S&P 500 is, uh, looking at this, we had a huge decline. But again, look at the S&P 500 has recovered as a higher percentage even than the Dow. Robert. Yeah, and, and I think it's important to note, like it, even if you go back to the initial crash uh, back in, in 08, it, it rebounds in, it bounces up and down, right? It's, it's like a ping pong ball. 
is that if it falls, it's going to equally bounce a little bit and it's going to slowly kind of bounce. This is, this is the, the nature of investors and stock investors and, and large managers of wealth funds. They're going to say, well, I'm going to take advantage of this low and then have it creep back up because they're taking advantage of that low. And they're like, oh, let's sell it off here. So as a, as a percentage, we're going to see this bouncing occur. What we want, what we want to see is some, some, you know, you see that 30 day, you know, climb, we want to see some, some stability there before we can really start to make some analysis as to whether we're headed back into a bull run or not. So it, it's, and, and this is my perspective and correct me if I'm wrong, Marcus, but we, we look at, the world as it was in 2008 and the world that is now they're they're completely different functionalities of the economic divit you know the economic groupings right so if you were to look at who was at the top of the smp find of 100 back in 2007 i think it was exxon mobil exxon mobil isn't even in the top 10 of valuations of companies now Right. So and, and Exxon Mobil was was a reigning champ for almost a decade or more of being in the top two or three companies. We're, we're completely economic. Uh, the visual, you know, the economy is divided up in different sectors now than it ever was then. So that's a that's a key thing to keep in mind, too. Right. Is that the economy is a um, as in sectors. Right. Is that um, if if St. George's tourism and construction, it's actually the same as it was back in 08. But the, the makeup of the economy is totally different now than it was then. Yeah, and great point. The longevity of the top, the S&P 500, uh, any of these companies, any company that was at the top historically back in the, the 70s, 80s, you saw the longevity of those companies stay there for a long time. Now, those companies are rotating through right now because companies have to be more nimble in, in reinventing themselves at a faster pace than they ever have before. And so there will be a couple big names that go out of business as a, as a cause of this, but we live in a world where someone else can grow to a point and take their place at a faster pace than they could have 20, 30 years ago. And, and, and what Robert's talking about here is if you look at the Dow Jones, like if, at this point right here, if you can see my screen, that at that time they thought that was the low, it went back up because a bunch of investors bought and then uh, it went down again, which that could be a possibility of what's happening, but we're going to see some bouncing there. But I wanted to uh, show basically market recovery time. The Great Depression, speaking of, this is speaking of the stock market. The stock market recovery time from the Great Depression took 302 months. The, the recession of 1987 took 21 months. The, the recession of 2000 took 47 months, and the Great Recession took 47 months for the stock market to fully recover percent of change in the Dow 12 months before the market crash. This is important because the bigger the faults run up, the overpricing causes a bigger drop in the Dow. So you can see the, the, and the direct correlation here, 1929, 12 months before, it went up 158%, the Dow, and it caused a bigger crash. 1987 had a run of 40.3%. 2000 had a run of 25.25%. 2008, 33.4%. But if you look at the 12 months prior to the Corona crash, they're calling it, was only a 13.6% run-up, which out of all the recessions is the, is the most modest 12-month run-up, which would suggest if you had a bouncy ball, using Robert's analogy, the higher I hold a bouncy ball and drop it, the bigger it's going gonna, it's gonna to be bounce. A smaller is going to have a smaller bounce, but it's going to be a more normalized. It's going to get back to normal faster. Um, and then this is interesting too. We won't spend much time talking about it, but you will have this graph is it's interesting to look at the peak to trough, meaning the, when was the highest to the very lowest, meaning it takes out all those little bounces along the way. We want to know from the very, very high to the very, very low, uh, what did that look like? So you can see here, uh, it shows the percentage of decline. Um, again, in the 1929s, the peak to trough was 89% uh, decline as opposed to even this last drop for the corona uh, crash was 27.9%. So it went down 27.9%, but uh, it's already recovered a portion of that. Not to say it's going to continue that way. It's a possibility, but it's probably going to bounce up and down along that range for a while. The other piece of this that I thought was interesting is, is how long did it take to get from the peak to the trough? And again, you can see in 2008, it was 16 months of it doing this before it got to the bottom. And so that goes back to the point of a lot of people reacted and a lot of people ignored that there was a problem leading into it, which, which 
actually was pouring fuel onto the fire and made a bigger problem because people ignored it. We're, we're in a position with the corona crash where nobody in the world is ignoring the problem and we're all reacting immediately. Like you look at the government stimuluses that are already out and available, where in 2008, they didn't offer government stimuluses and things for a long time because they were waiting to see what the total reaction or, or, or effect was before they started offering those, those opportunities. So right now it's showing corona uh, crashes one month because that's all the data we have is one month. We imagine that's gonna be more months, but I, I don't think it's gonna take the same amount of time to go from peak to trough that we saw in previous recessions. Robert. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment on the 87. That, has, that was largely, uh, if, if you recall, and correct me if I'm wrong, it was largely around the oil uh, crisis and what was going on in the Middle East. And so if we think of it as, it, 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 again, it's something outside of America's, it's a, it's a global economic crash, where if you were to look at 2000, it was the dot-com bubble, look at 2008, that was, these were all localized um, challenges. It was built on systems that we created for ourselves, same thing in 29. Um, 87 was largely out of our control. I mean, I guess you could argue that one way or another, but uh, it was largely due to a, a global economic tip over versus us being a, a, an institutional source of the, of, the, of the recession. So I think there's some correlations between that 87 crash and this crash is that there's some things that we just can't deal with. And globally, we're all on the same playing field, sans China, because they, anyway, um, but we're all kind of on the same playing field with what we're going to be dealing with. Great point. So again, the two big correlations that people are drawing the conclusion is, they say, uh, home, last time home prices were this amount, was 2007 and it was over everything was overpriced which caused the crash of 2008 to 2010 and then they're they're also drawing a direct correlation the stock market crashed meaning that the whole economy is going to crash a stock market correction does not always equal a total market uh correct uh, correction um so we can't we we gotta look at those as it is a, a cause and there is an effect but it always doesn't show up the same way so let's talk about home pricing for a minute because this is the, this is the one that people were talking about the bubble even before coronavirus hit. So a couple of things to look at from an uh, annual home price appreciation in 2000 to 2005 uh, across the country. This is a national uh, number. Is uh, again keep in mind that the government likes to see a three to four percent healthy appreciation year over year, and we were seeing as a national average huge appreciation leading up to uh, the Great Recession of 2008. Uh, the last six years, we saw a more modest appreciation. Now, we know in Utah, these numbers were higher because Utah is a stronger economy uh, than that of the rest of the country. Um, but we can see on a national average. Um, another thing that I think is really interesting is uh, this graph showing the median sales price of homes in the United States all the way back, I went back to 1990, uh, and the recession of 1990 to today. And then I drew in this red line. This red line represents a 4% appreciation. So you can see from uh, 1990, um, home, uh, the, the median home price was $117,000. That'd be pretty sweet, right? If we could go out and buy a bunch of houses at $117,000. But if you look at 4% appreciation over time, as we got into 2004, Look at the gap of where homes were selling as opposed to what a healthy appreciation would have been. And how many years of that did we have of this buildup of overpricing before the market finally, before people finally said, this is getting out of control. Buyer demand dropped instantly and then the, and then the listings trailed behind it and people weren't able to sustain that. Um, if you look at how long it took us to recover, all the way till about 2014 is when our prices started to normalize again. And we draw in a new line at 4% based on here is we can see that we actually right now, based on this new trend line is prices are actually based on a 4% appreciation. Prices are actually lower than what they could healthily be in today's market. But if you draw a direct line back, it seems like they're overpriced because prices, the median prices of homes are much higher than they were in 2007, but everything else, inflation, uh, our population growth, wages have all grown with it to accommodate that 4% appreciation over time, where in 2007 it was too early. So if you look at um, 
this graph here, home price changes during the last five recessions. It's actually really interesting to look at this. 1980, during that recession, unemployment was going up, GDP was going down, but uh, home prices still went up 6.1% across the country. 1981, up 3.5% during that recession. The recession of uh, 1991, they declined 1.9%. You can see that right here. And then in 2008, this was the big one. Prices went down 20% in that time. But you look, three out of the last five recessions, home prices still managed to increase. Marcus, something to point out about that graph. For me, this graph really illustrates something and what I've been telling my clients. Based on basic supply and demand, I do not think this is going to be a housing-based recession, right? But none of these, these last four recessions, 1991 wasn't really a housing recession either. Um, and, and we had, you know, pretty, we had either growth or stability within housing prices. But 2008 was obviously a housing recession. And that's what I've been telling them. This is not a housing recession. It's whatever type of recession it is, it's not in housing. Great, great point, Dane. I mean, the, the, so the, the, you brought up two important things. Buyer demand, which we're going to talk about uh, that. That's a big uncertainty for us is, is what will buyer demand look like in 60 days from now? And then the other thing is this was a 2008 was a housing driven recession. So uh, the only word I'd add to you, you said housing recession. I'd say housing driven recession because a recession affects everything, but it was driven. The cause of it was tied directly to the housing market having problems internally. Right. So let's keep looking at it. great point. Thank you. So let's look at uh, mortgage standards are nothing like they were in 2008. So let's focus specifically on, on comparing to 2008 for a minute. There is a, uh, an index called the Mortgage Credit Availability Index. Now, internally, uh, mortgage lenders track this index and basically says how much credit is actually available for us to give out. And if you look back in uh, June 2004 to June 2008, this is what caused the housing bubble is the uh, mortgage credit availability index was soaring over 800 where you can see since 2008 when they started coming in and saying, okay, this isn't a matter of someone walking to a bank and you saying, well, how much money do you make? And they're like, I, I don't know, 800,000 a year. I work at McDonald's. They're like, okay, well then we'll give you a loan of this amount of money. It was called a stated income loan. You stated what income you made. There was li little verification or standards around, around it and you got the loan. And the reason they were willing to give away a loan so easily is because they're like, we have all this credit to give out. We got to get the money out. And so this was a huge problem of what caused the housing bubble before. But you can see the lending criteria changed significantly as a result of the, the housing driven bubble or housing, housing driven recession of 2008. And it stayed relatively low. We saw a swing up where we saw some standards being lifted. Um, but it stayed relatively low over time of being you have to hit these criteria to be able to get a loan. And that remains in effect today where the people that have been buying houses over the last several years have a much higher probability of being able to maintain that home through an economic recession and a downturn than they had here. Because that guy flipping burgers at McDonald's that said he made $300,000 a year and got a loan, uh, it was really hard to maintain the expenses with that house on either no salary or a very low salary, which was his actual, not his stated income, but his actual income. So people's immediate reaction was, I got to get rid of the house. I'm going to stop making payments. I'm going to walk away from this, um, which uh, we know is not the case we're sitting in right now. The next piece is we don't have a surplus of homes on the market. We have a shortage. And so if you look back at 2007, at that time, people were building faster than the population was growing. So more inventory was getting on the market uh, before it was even needed. It was in anticipation. Remember the word spec house? Spec stands for speculation. People were speculating at some point, someone's going to need another house. I'll put this out there and someone will end up buying it at some point. So there's less, there was less homes built on speculation. There was a lot more homes built on demand. And that is going to be a big driver in how this market turns around is we have that pent up buyer demand, not inventory of speculation of product that really wasn't needed. It was 
the, the developer was hoping people would want it, if that makes sense. So look at the, the shortage. Our, our uh, inventory of homes nationally was 3.1 um, as of right before the coronavirus. And yes, we anticipate this to go up some, but not, it wasn't up in leading up to it. Um, let me show you this a little bit differently. Uh, this graph shows the, re the population growth in the state of Utah since 19, basically 1990 or 1985. You can see the population of Utah continue to grow up. Each one of these gray shaded areas represents a recession. Look at this, 1990, in the recession, our population increased in the state of Utah. 2000, recession, our population continued to increase in the state of Utah. 2008 to 2010, recession, our population continued to increase in the state of Utah, and since then has grown at a faster pace than it's ever grown before. Let's compare it to this graph over the same time, which this graph shows uh, new private housing units, so building permits issued by the, uh, the governments. So look what happened here uh, in, in comparing it to the population growth. Look how modest this line is as opposed to this. We started building, and let's, let's specifically go to uh, up to, leading up to 2008. 2000, we started issuing a bunch of permits as fast as we could, and then all of a sudden in 2008 when the market stopped, population continued to increase, but units stopped being built. Building came to an absolute halt. Building permits were not being issued, and that may remain true all the way to 2014 before builders started getting the confidence of like, oh, we're running out of inventory. We need to start building new product. And that's when we started getting uh, permits issued again. And we can see the permits have been consistent since 2014 to 2020. But we have, we have several years that we were behind on inventory because we weren't issuing permits as fast as our population was growing. And that remains true leading up to now. This is my personal opinion because I can't forecast out the graft of Utah's population forward. But I'm anticipating that a lot of people that live in these uh, high dense states or cities are gonna be wanting to move to a location with lower density. Already people were flooding from California to Utah. I suspect that's gonna get even uh, accelerated because people are gonna be like, I'm not, I'm not gonna sit through another one of these pandemics in a high populated area. So that is a big piece. Um, Chief economist said the housing sector enters this recession underbuilt rather than overbuilt. That means as an economy rebounds, which it will at some stage, this, this means we're going to recover quicker because we're, we're entering a recession already underbuilt. Whereas opposed to 2008, what caused the recession was one of the causes of the recession was we were overbuilt at the time. Um, houses became too expensive. Just real quick comment on this. We know from an affordability standpoint, that uh, in 2006, it was taking over 25% of the median income to buy a house, as opposed to today with low interest rates and higher wages, it's only taking about 15% on average to be able to afford a house. So from an affordability standpoint, and again, we know in the state of Utah, we've been basically sitting at a perfectly affordable market right now, um, as it is, and we'll see some changes to that. Um, last, uh, well, number five piece that I wanted to show you that is a, a huge difference between the Corona recession as opposed to the Great Recession is the position people are in from an equity rich standpoint. If you think about someone that lost their house in, in uh, 2008, 2009, it's they over leveraged themselves into a home, they borrowed money on cars. Uh, basically, since money was so available and basically free, people were taking as much money as they could to where instantly when they didn't have enough money to cover their bills, they didn't have any reserves in their net worth to be able to carry themselves through. So they instantly went to, screw this, I'm not making any payments. In fact, a lot of people are like, I'm gonna rip the pipes out of my walls and all this stuff out of spite uh, because they got angry. They, they, weren't, they didn't put themselves in, a, in an equity rich position to be able to help themselves through the recession. Where if you look back at 2005, 2006, 2007, uh, the home total home equity cashed out was 824 billion, as opposed to the last three years, only 232 million has been cashed out in billions of people refinancing their houses. And again, they're going through this. Not only is that number significantly less, but the lending restrictions around how to get that money were significantly tighter, meaning more, only qualified buyers for the most part. We're actually cashing out that money and still leaving a good portion of equity in the house. 
as opposed to people that were getting equity out of houses before would say, yeah, the house is worth 300,000 today, but in six months from now, it's gonna be worth 320,000, so I'll take $320,000 uh, out of the house today. And lenders were like, makes sense, let's do it. Where that has not been the case over the last three years. So even though people are going to be uh, struggling financially, depending on um, their economic class, their income class, it, it's going to feel different in that regard across the board. Let's talk about unemployment rate. I, I saved this one to last because in my opinion, this is one of the biggest uncertainties of, of how long this is gonna last and how quickly we'll be able to recover. And I'm very confident we will recover. It's just the timing of how long it will take to recover uh, is really going to be driven off of what does buyer demand look like on the other side of this. And buyer demand is going to be driven specifically around uh, uh, people's income and their lendability, meaning can I qualify for a loan? Uh, we already know we're walking into this with low inventory already. So we know the inventory piece is not going to be the problem. It's going to be the buyer's ability to buy. Um, the longer this goes on is we're going to see more and more buyer demand decrease because more people will become unlendable. So uh, just uh, in the last couple of weeks, over 10 million Americans have filed for unemployment. And we expect that that's going to continue to increase every week. I mean, drive by any a uh, big shopping mall. I live by uh, Station Park. You drive by, the parking lot is, is a ghost town. It's empty, which means that those small businesses are not generating income. Uh, they don't have people in there working in the stores. And we're seeing particularly that segment. Anyone that, de that demands foot traffic for revenue is, that's where we're seeing the biggest piece of unemployment come into play. Um, but if you look historically all the way back to 1980, again, the gray areas show unemployment you can see that in each one of these sections, unemployment increased significantly. And the biggest swing being the recession of 2008, going all the way up to 10% uh, unemployment. Um, if you look back at current unemployment rates compared to the past financial crisis, this is, uh, was turned out by Goldman Sachs this last week. Uh, the Great Depression went from 8.7 to 20.1%. The Great Recession, so the last one of 2008, we went from 7.3 to 6.7, and they're predicting that we're going to go uh, from where we've been sitting at, at 3 to 4%. Um, they feel like we're going to hit 15% this year and immediately start recovering uh, with a 2021 6 to 8%, 2022 at 5%, 2023 be getting back down to closer to 4%. And again, this is Goldman Sachs projections. But you can see one of the beautiful things we're starting at is we're we're starting at a historical low unemployment. Like these recessions started at rates that we're not even to yet from an unemployment standpoint. Last piece to look at here is the only thing I'd change about this graph, if, if you're gonna show this to clients or think through it, it says unemployment rates in home sales. It says do not have a direct relationship. I think they do have a direct relationship, but it's not as strong of a relationship as a lot of people are, are drawing. This yellow line shows the unemployment rate uh, and how it, affect, how it shows up in relation to home sales. So if you look at uh, 1990, unemployment rate went up, but home sales went up. In uh, 2000, unemployment rate was going up, but home sales, number of home sales went up as well. The anomaly here is the one of 2008 when unemployment took a, a big spike. That is where we saw lending uh, standards were starting to be tightened and home sales were not happening the way they were prior to this because we saw this over bubble. And then we saw over the last several years, home sales stayed modest uh, and unemployment continued to drop. So it's an interesting look there. To me, this is the biggest uncertainty is, is how many people are going to be without a job for how long and who is go who's going to work themselves out of the market. If you remember last week in our conversation, we talked about, we drew the buyer pool and there's a portion of them that are, are getting out of, they're not eligible to be in the buyer pool right now. And, and that is going to grow on a day-to-day -day basis. Luckily, the, uh, the government is doing some things to close that gap right now. Uh, particularly, the biggest economic uh, stimulus they have going on right now is the, is the Paycheck Protection Plan, which is basically saying uh, a qualifying small business or a qualifying business could get a, a loan of up to two and a half times their monthly payroll expense if they keep people employed. 
So there's a lot of people applying for that money to say, yeah, we're going to keep these people employed because on the other side of this, I want to keep this talent in place. Um, and then a real quick comment around this is uh, in the last several recessions, the portion of the job market that got hit the hardest are these small, uh, small businesses. Um, each one of you as a real estate agent, we are small businesses. We need to be aware of this is these, we are in the category of being hit the hardest. But again, if you look at a lot of these um, uh, businesses that count on disposable income, you think about like uh, cell phone covers and things like that that people don't need, but they want. That's where the first place they're gonna cut back on spending. Um, luckily, we're a small business in a sector where people are still gonna need housing because we're walking into a recession with lower inventory. Um, I'll send you that out. A hey, can I, can I just touch base on the unemployment? Please do. I think, because uh, a lot of us on this call might understand this, and I, I just think it's important that we all just look, frame this in the same frame of mind. So the, the payment protection plan uh, is really based around a very simple idea. Marcus, you employ several people, correct? What correct. about two dozen, something around those numbers? Um, yeah. The cost of hiring somebody new to do a job is exponentially more, more often than not than to just keep somebody that's already doing the job at an adequate level, right? So these furloughs and things like that, that they're, you know, Tesla just furloughed a bunch of its people, in no way, shape, or form does Elon Musk want to lose all those people. If he can go right back into keeping all those people and keeping them employed, he's going to do that because smart business people know if I have to lay all these people off, eventually I'm going to have to go hire other people and hire new people. If he can stave off the ability to make those layoffs because of this, this so unique of a situation, uh, they're going to make those moves. So this, this is the brilliance behind the PPP is that um, the co it makes way more financial ses uh, sense as a business to hold on to the people you have versus just letting them go and say, well, I'll let the cards land as they may, right? They're going to fight off that bankruptcy type of a moment. Um, watching bankruptcy is going to be an important thing that we track uh, over these next few weeks because you, there's no coming back from that, right? It's like you have to restructure. That's the part of of filing for bankruptcy is that you have to restructure. You have to lay people off. You have to get rid of capital. Um, capital assets to, to make sense of that bankruptcy, right? So we have to know all these people are staying at home. They're spending less than they would have otherwise, which means that the money that they have in their hands are the money that they have. When they go back to work, there's, there's a, a strong likelihood that their spending habits aren't going to be the same, but the fundamentals are going to stay in place. And housing is a fundamental, right? And so the reason we would see uh, housing not getting a big impact is that if I had, if I was stretching it with a $600,000 house and my mortgage on that, I might say, well, this is a wake up call. I don't actually need to be spending uh, 3,000 or $4,000 a month on housing. I could go actually buy a house that's 350,000 and, and get to the same place while I'm spending less uh, on my mortgage, right? As a percentage. And that goes back to that percentage they're using of their salary on housing. That means that we still, as, as real estate agents, we still win, right? We sell their $600,000 house and then we help them buy a $350,000 house. It just changes the dynamic of our consumer and our clients for what they buy. It doesn't keep them from buying, it just changes what they buy. Great so point. Marcus, on this to, to kind of uh, dovetail on that, because we had such low unemployment um, before we started with this whole thing, like I have a client who is working, she works at HR for a, a medium sized company and she has to onboard a hundred people in the next 30 days. So there, there were significant staffing shortages before this whole thing started. Now, some of the demand of like those positions, some of them might've gone away, but I have a client that works for Amazon and they had like a hundred thousand jobs that needed to be filled. Um, and I think what we're going to see and not all of those jobs go away in this new universe. And so I think what we're going to see is a lot of a lot of churn, as Robert was saying. We're going to see people making changes. If you get because if you're a server, you know you're probably not going to be able to work for the next little while. Maybe you decide to go back to school and and get some kind of tech certificate and re-enter the job force in six months to go into IT or something. We're going to see probably a lot of churn. But there was a huge demand out there for, for good employees. 
uh, before this whole thing started. And I don't see that going away, but I think we will see probably a lot of churn and, and yeah. there's opportunity. Great point. I mean, last week, remember, we talked about uh, these positive triggers that we're all waiting for. Once those positive triggers come out, we, we talked about this recession coming on like a slight switch. It was like it hit and we're, and we're in it. Uh, the thing, a couple main points, switching our conversation now to action plan, because what I don't want you to take away from this is, oh, Marcus told me this is not 2008, so we have nothing to worry about. We do have things to worry about. Because this, while this went off like a light switch, when we turn, it's not going to be like turning a light switch back on and the world's not going to look like it did before. So if you keep saying, if this is part of your vernacular right now, I can't wait things, for things to get back to normal, a news flash to you is the normal as we knew it will never be in our world again. The world is going to look different when that light switch comes back on and what you do today, regardless of when that uh, economy, uh, those, those positive economic triggers come around, regardless of when that is, whether it's in two months, six months, 12 months, whatever that is, what you do today is going to determine uh, the level of your income in, at that time. There's going to be a direct correlation to what you're doing with your time now, as opposed to how you're going to survive and thrive on the other side of this. Let me illustrate a couple points with that um, to, to wrap up our conversation. Real quickly is do not lose sight that there are things going on in, in, the, in the marketplace right now. This is the last three days in Washington County. Uh, Monday, there was 41 listings taken. Tuesday, there were 49 listings taken. Uh, uh, today, we reported 24 new listings taken. Look at Salt Lake County, 21, 89, 83. Weaver and Davis County, 17, 46, 44. So if you're not taking listings right now, then someone else is taking those listings. If you, um, real quickly, if you're not already reading the book Shift again, you absolutely should be sticking your nose daily back into this book. But I wanted to read something that I think is really relevant to uh, our action plan and what we should be doing right now. Uh, basically, it says here, the law states that the available income in a market determines the number of agents in that market. So it's talking about our business right now. This is not talking about the overall economy. This is talking about your business as a real estate agent. The law states that the available income in the market, we saw, I just showed you listings are happening, closings are happening, determines the number of agents in that market. We know right now we've got more agents than we've ever had in the state of Utah. As the number of transactions rises, so does the number of agents. We saw that happen. We saw a bunch of people getting into business over the last five, six years. They're like, that's easy money. I'm in. Let's do this. Conversely, when the number of available transactions falls, so does the number of agents. So while there are deals going on, we are going to see the number of deals over the next 60, 90 days or more be less. Even though January and February, we're on pace, we were on pace to have our biggest year ever, in the state of Utah, already March, we saw a decline. We're gonna see a bigger decline over the next several months. So when the number of available, available transactions falls, so does the number of agents. We are going to see a bunch of agents that are not leaning into these conversations that are going to get out of business. They don't have the stomach or the, or the business sense to know how to survive. People are attracted to the industry by the perceived perception, the perceived income opportunity, and driven out by the reality of the competition for it. People perceive that, that, that there's a ton of money to be made in real estate, and then once they see the reality of how hard it is, and it's harder now, they're going to get out. Since perception tends to trail behind reality, two lag periods show up in every economic shift. So I'm going to tell you these two periods. You tell me which one we're in. The down lag and the up lag. The down lag occurs because the number of agents doesn't decline until the number of transactions has already been dropping for some time. So this isn't like a bunch of agents are all turning their license in with their head head hanging low right now. They're all holding their license and they will hold it until it comes time to renew and they're gonna be like, well, I don't know if I should renew or not. They're go it's going to be a lag of how quickly these agents drop out. The low point of income opportunity then occurs when the most agents are chasing the least amount of income. That is where we're sitting right now. We've got the most amount of agents, almost 26,000 in the state of Utah, 
and our, the income opportunity is dropping. So we have more agents chasing the lowest amount of income right now. The up lag works in reverse when the transactions increase. So when the economy starts to, to rebound, the high income opportunity point occurs on the way up when the fewest agents are chasing the most amount of income. So the question then becomes, if you wait to say, I'll wait for those economic triggers to make some changes in my life, you will be too late to the game because the agents that are gonna eat up market share are the ones that are living in tomorrow's world today. So what does that what does an agent of tomorrow, a successful agent of tomorrow's business and life look like today? Well, I'll tell you what it doesn't look like. It's not them out doing open houses. It's not them be sitting in the office going to classes. One of the things they're doing is they're leaning into conversations like this, so I applaud you. The other thing they're doing is they're going, they're not only doubling down on their lead generation, they're three or four times in their lead generation efforts right now. A couple quick things from the shift that we talked about last week is number one is get real, get right. If your mindset is not appropriate right now of use your men, if your mental clarity is not, I am going to win through this recession, you need to work on your mindset. Next, we've been talking about remargining your expenses. Right now is the time on a personal level and a business level is play red light, green light. What expenses must I continue to make because I'm getting a direct return from those? What are the expenses I need to eliminate right now? Do more with less. And then this last one is so critical is you've got to be connecting on a day-to-day -day basis. When I set right now, I'm setting goals with my, my four daughters every single night. One of the goals they have to set is who are you going to connect with tomorrow? And so they're outlining the night before of who it is they're going to connect with. My seven-year-old, she's going through her cousins. I'm going to FaceTime Delilah. I'm going to write grandma a note. But on a personal level, connecting is important. On a business level, it is even more relevant because every one of your clients is gonna show up at a different time ready to go based on how the, re this, the corona recession is going to affect them, but the connection you build with them now will determine your ability to help them on the other side of this. Thoughts, or, thoughts questions, or comments? So I, I love Mark as well done, man. I think there was a lot of killer info in there. And, and I had, it's funny because you kind of went through that with me before and I got a bunch of new things out of it the second time. So um, I, I know we're going to be recording this and we'll, we'll share it back to everybody that uh, that's been registered and, and not, if not more, but I'd encourage you to go back through it, right. And digest some of the things and, and some of the concepts. Um, one of the, one of the big, uh, it's, it's interesting because you get in the business and you think, well, I got a cold call. I got to maybe for sale by owners and expires and things like that. And we got to remember that's igniting your business, right? That's striking a match to your business to help start growing what is the most valuable piece of your business. I asked a recruit yesterday. I said, hey, you know, do you see yourself at one point in time selling your business? Because he actually, his dad owns some, uh, some oil change companies and he's trying to gear it up to sell it. I said, how do you sell that business? And he says, well, I, um, you know, show what the value is. And I said, what's the, what is it, you know, what, what has value? And it's the machinery, the tools, but the client uh, list of people, the, the past sales and the, and the prospect of future sales that sell this business, right? Well, we're all business owners. So what's the value of your business? It's not your ability to go call it for sale by owner and expired. The value of your business is the database. And Gary Keller says, if you want a big business, you have to have a big database, right? The, the size of your da database is directly proportional to the size of your business. If you want 20 transactions, your database is gonna reflect 20 transactions. If you wanna get to 40, you have to grow that database. Now you can use some of these things like for sale by owners and expires to build that database, but you can't just churn through it because that's not adding to the data bank, right? It's, you have to grow that. And the only way that you do that is coming up with systems to be able to connect to that database over and over and build those relationships so that they over time just continue to come back to you. That's the business that we're in. The business isn't being able to go buy and sell them a home, right? That's a, that's an expectation around what you do every day. Your business is the database and the relationships you're building with that database. There's no better time than now to connect with them and then add to it, right? We can't go do open houses in a lot of places in the country. Um, I was talking to agents saying, well, how many of your thousand friends on Facebook are you actually friends with versus kind of, uh, uh, they, they kind of recognize you or have seen a post. 
right? Take this opportunity to go through your Facebook page and start building relationships with people that you only have maybe one thing in common with and find out if you have more things in common with. But I think um, the, the number one feature that we have the ability to do is we obviously Keller Williams command has that function built right into the systems, but whatever system that you're using, you have to dive into that database, get clear around how you're going to connect with them over time. And the top agents do that at the highest levels. The top agents aren't the masters of expires and for sale by owners. The top agents are the ones that have mastered their database and know how to continually add and grow that database. Beautiful. Um, to wrap up real quickly, just, I want to thank you all for being on. We've got uh, 83 people on the call right now. Um, yeah, give me a quick thumbs up or uh, something in the chat to let me know you're finding value in this. I'm committed to bringing this level of content weekly. Um, if you guys will continue to, to lean in and participate in it. If there's a specific topic you want me to focus on this coming week, um, please post, uh, I'd like to hear about this or tell me more about that in, in the comments. I'll read every single one of them as a follow up to this because I want to make sure I'm bringing content that you want to hear. Um, but I'm super grateful to be in business with you. Um, yes, we live in a, an interesting time. Yes, there's some uncertainty. Um, but I will tell you our, our future is bright. The, the future of, of our business is bright. The people that will uh, lean in right now and, and question everything as far as how do I become a better business person? How do I increase skill set? What does the changed value of the consumer look like and how do I fill that gap? If you're having those, those internal conversations or conversations in platforms like this, we will win. We will pick up market share on the other side of this and we will all be stronger for it both on a personal and a business level, but I couldn't be more proud to be in business with you guys. Thanks for being on. Uh, Robert, did you want St. George peeps to stick on for a minute for some announcements? Yeah, I know it's one o'clock, but if everybody from St. George wants to stick around and I can do a couple of announcements uh, that I wanted to get out, uh, let everybody know some changes. Uh, Michelle, I want to address your question.